Hello, this is Rick Miller here from the Miller and Everton podcast, back again for another very exciting episode with another superb guest. And you've got a real treat today. I've got Dr. Stephanie Senaf, who's here to talk to us all about um, a compound which you may or may not have heard of, which is glyphosate. Now, before we introduce uh, Dr. Senaf and um, her amazing background and credentials. I just want to say she does have an amazing book, which I have here called Toxic Legacy. And I'll be putting a link in the description after the show so that you can purchase your coffee uh, copy. But I have read it from cover to cover. It's one of the most fascinating books I've read in a long, long time. A topic that I thought I knew something about, um, but clearly had not done my due diligence at all in terms of the background, unlike uh, Stephanie, obviously, who will give us the, uh, the full rundown soon. Um, but it's a really interesting read. Um, it takes you through the full history of why glyphosate is such a problem. Um, sometimes, obviously, it's referred to as Roundup. You might have heard that as well. That's its, its brand name. And also, it is a deep dive into the science. Uh, for some people, that might be um, that might be uh, off-putting, but please don't be because uh, Stephanie does take you on a bit of a journey and she breaks up all the chapters so beautifully with stories and insights, um, just showing you the, the massive repercussions of, of glyphosate on both health and the environment. So, um, so let's let's introduce her. Who is who is Stephanie? So Stephanie is an, an, a, a very uh, acclaimed researcher from MIT um, in a number of different different fields, but her major interest has been obviously in this area of, of glyphosate um, that we'll be touching on today. So let's introduce her right now. So hey, Stephanie, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, not at all. Not at all. It's just it's amazing to have you here. So um, as I as I talked about in the first few moments with your book, um, let's let's dive right in and, and talk about um, this this compound glyphosate and what what the problem is. Obviously, we still use this um, this compound in the UK, um, sadly, and in parts of Europe as well. Um, but what why why all the fuss? What's the problem with glyphosate at all? And what what is it? Yes, it's an it's a, it's used heavily in agriculture, um, really all around the world. Uh, it was uh, in, it was discovered back in the 1960s. Uh, Monsanto was the was the holds the patent for agriculture for as a as an herbicide. Uh, they mm -hmm. found out that it kills kills plants. Actually, it kills all plants mm -hmm. except for those that they've engineered to resist it. Um, and the and the claim was that it's very safe for humans. And therefore, mm. it's a fantastic herbicide compared to all the other herbicides, which are all, uh, they know they're toxic. But the glyphosate, wonderful, because it's completely safe for humans, and therefore, they're very careless in its use. It's heavily used in, in agriculture, and it is the number one uh, herbicide in the world. And it comes up uh, extensively as a contaminant in foods. Now, the mm. U.S. government doesn't bother to test for it because, of course, it's so safe. Why test? They know it's all over the food mm. supply. Uh, my friend Zan Honeycutt of Moms Across America has recently done two studies, one on uh, processed foods, um, the most popular um, uh, stores that sell, you know, like McDonald's, those kind of fast foods, mm -hmm. the fast food industry, the 20 most, most common fast food companies. She found 100% 100, uh, 100 of those samples were uh, that she tested were contaminated with glyphosate. And then she oh, did school goodness. lunches at the public schools, 95% were, t were uh, contaminated with glyphosate, and some with quite high levels. So it's like it's all over the food supply. And um, as long as it's safe, we're fine, right? But it's not safe. That's the problem. It's not safe. And, and they've assured us that it is, and it's a lie. And I'm very con convinced that I'm right about that. Absolutely. And, and you go into explicit detail in your book about, you know, all those different sort of uh, dangers um, associated with it. And as you say, if people are being told from the the pulpit, oh, it's absolutely fine. There's nothing to worry about at all. Then some people will literally just shrug their shoulders and say, oh, well, it's fine to eat McDonald's or whatever it is that I'm feeding my children. But what what sort of uh, dangers have actually been linked to this 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 herbicide uh, glyphosate over over the the years in your research that you that you actually did? Yes, and my book has many, many references to papers that are coming out. And actually, since my book was published, many new papers have been showing up. I can barely keep up with them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so pleased that the research literature is finally, you know, people are doing the research to test glyphosate's toxicity because they're finally realizing that it is toxic. And for many years, they didn't bother to test glyphosate. Part of that is, of course, they often get funded by the industry and you don't bite the hand that feeds you. So there's a lot of situations mm -hmm. where 
people choose not to do research uh, on things that are going to hurt the whoever's giving them money, right? And so that's a trick that yes. Monsanto does is to make sure to fund the people who might do the research uh, to make sure they won't type of thing, you know, to keep glyphosate from being um, discovered as being uh, toxic. Uh, but that's, uh, it's really, uh, you know, they kind of, it was really Seralini, I would say, who opened the door um, in 2012. Mm. He, he and his team published a paper on a rat study. And it was a copy of the rat study that had been done by Monsanto, uh, where they had exposed the rats to low doses of glyphosate uh, for, for three months. And they had a rule that if you didn't see any evidence of harm by three months, that was fine. It was good. You could say it was safe. And Monsanto, and then uh, so Seralini repeated that same study, pretty much the same design, uh, exposing the rats to glyphosate. And after three months, they, they you couldn't really tell the difference between the, the treated mice and the control group. After four months, you started to see problems. And when you kept going, by the end of their life, the females had massive mammary tumors, the males had kidney damage and liver damage, and both sexes had reproductive issues and, the, and early death. So there were all kinds of problems that showed up, but it took time. And that, I think, is what's the trick with glyphosate. If you don't look very long, you don't see the damage, and then you can declare that it's safe because it's a slow kill. And I talk about that in my book. It has a really nice. unique mechanism of toxicity that's subtle and cumulative. So very, very dangerous. So the longer you live, the more you're eating glyphosate, the more you've got all over your body. It gets into your yeah. proteins by mistake in place of the coding amino acid glycine. This is a theory of mine, which I go at length in my book to show the evidence mm -hmm. that supports it, including evidence from Monsanto's own studies. Um, yeah. I certainly believe it's happening. And if it's happening, it explains all the different diseases that are going up dramatically in our population in step in, in exact step with the rise in glyphosate usage on core crops. So I think, you know, you look at the American population, we're all hugely overweight. You know, autism rates are through the roof. I mean, we have a mm -hmm. huge number of problems with depression and Alzheimer's is going up. I mean, all these different conditions, cancers are going up over time. Uh, we're really suffering with a tremendously sick population. I would say right now, it's very disturbing. Many of the children have autoimmune diseases and allergies asthma, mm. eczema, you know, it's really exactly. bad. I think that it's a crisis. And um, and it annoys me that the government is just going along with business as yeah. usual, even though the kids are are clearly in trouble. Yeah, if it, it feels like a sort of profits over people scenario in, in so many ways. And I think the, your, your phrase, it's a crisis, is absolutely, absolutely correct in that sense. And when I was reading through your book, uh, I even got sort of, I guess, a little deja vu from a, a film which some people might have uh, seen, which is called Dark Waters, and it, it features the uh, very famous actor Mark oh, Ruffalo yes. and about the DuPont uh, uh, sort of catastrophe and the use of forever chemicals. And I won't spoil the, the, the entire film, but I do <clears throat> excuse me, highly recommend to watch that. Yes, I saw that film. It, it's very good. It's a similar scenario that we're talking about here. It's a slow mm -hmm. burn. And the, the dangers uh, were only found out um, many, many years to come. But yeah, please check that out. And I'll put a link in the description for people who want to see that. So so we're not just talking about um, a compound that, that has a, an immediate toxicity. It's just, as, as we've talked about, it's a slow burn because of the way it substitutes amino acids. The mm -hmm. glycine this is one of the key, key amino acids in, uh, in, in life. And... Also, glyphosate has effects on the environment as well, which you talked about mm -hmm. in your book as well, and, and, and particularly on things like the soil quality as well. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you might mention some of that as well. Uh, yes, Stephanie. many things are there in the soil. And it's, and in fact, the soil is very similar to the gut. There's a lot of parallels. Yeah. And uh, you know, I heard a talk by Professor Don Hubert was when I first discovered glyphosate. He gave a two-hour presentation in 2012. And um, and he talked about the soil microbes and the gut microbes, and both of them being disrupted by glyphosate. Uh, it chelates minerals, so it makes the mm. minerals in, unaccess, unaccessible to the gut microbes and also to the host cells as well. So we become deficient. We become simultaneously deficient and toxic with certain minerals such as iron and zinc and manganese uh, because we can't our body can't handle them correctly when glyphosate is holding mm. onto them so tightly. It really messes things up. Um, exactly. And then uh, and the gut microbes get killed off, especially the beneficial ones. And then we get all kinds of issues with inflammatory gut. 
leaky gut, you know, all these issues with the gut, which I think is where the whole problem starts uh, critically with the gut. And we've become aware that the gut microbes are so important to our health. We didn't know that. We didn't have a whole lot of papers on the gut microbiome, you know, 30 yeah. years ago. But as our gut got worse and worse, we became aware that there was a problem with the gut microbes. And now there's a lot of studying going on and showing direct correlations, you know, with deficiencies in certain microbes and things like Parkinson's disease, autism, you know, these diseases, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, there's a connection, a very strong connection to the gut. And, um, and, and so that's where the problem starts. And of course, you eat the food, the, the glyphosate gets in the gut, it messes up the microbes. And then a whole bunch of systems get out of whack. And it's really, really um, disturbing what happens over time. Yeah, exactly. Because there might be, um, I guess, people listening in who, and obviously, there's such a variety of different diets that we see amongst our men at Miller and Everton. But the, uh, the you know, obviously, the, the things like carnivore diets and, uh, you know, very low carbohydrate keto diets are very popular at the moment, you know, for, for various different reasons, for different conditions, they're getting a lot of press. But this isn't, uh, glyphosate is not an issue of just, well, if you eat plants and you eat grains and you eat other sort of cereal compounds or any any type of um, food, really, it obviously if it gets into us, it can also get into ruminant animals as well that are grazing, mm -hmm. uh, and obviously if they're being lot fed as well, uh, all sorts of different foods like grains as well. Then indeed they're going to be getting tons of um, uh, of glyphosate into their into their body mass, and then you're eating mm -hmm. it. So, yes. so it really is a, a kind of a, a, a kind of a an attack from all angles in many ways and you can't avoid it necessarily by by just just uh adopting a, a, the latest diet um, you've got to really think about this in other ways but we'll perhaps we'll get into some steps later about what people can do about it we'll let the uh, we'll let the story <laughs> unfold a little bit more first so one thing that i think is also really important to talk about as well other than uh the impact that glyphosate has on the immediate person the toxicity uh, and on the environment it's also the role that it, it seems to have with with deuterium as well. And uh, one of our, our previous guests that we had on the podcast was the, the lovely Dr. Boros, who who came on and talked to us all about deuterium because that's been his life's uh, kind of work, really, um, as a clinician and as a scientist. And uh, we heard all about the sorts of amazing things that can be done when you deplete deuterium from the body a little bit, especially if you're overloaded. But there also seems to be an interplay here with glyphosate as well, which I would love if you don't mind unpacking a bit, Stephanie. And maybe for those who who, who have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to deuterium, maybe do a very brief, you know, what is deuterium, <laughs> well, if you don't mind. Uh, yes, of course. And I do want to say that uh, Laszlo introduced deuterium to me in uh, December of 2019. And oh, wow. it was an epiphany. It was the second epiphany after the one with uh, with Professor Huber, who gave this two hour presentation in 2012. I was convinced after that talk that autism is primarily caused by glyphosate. The epidemic in autism it is glyphosate is the primary source of that epidemic. I feel very confident that I'm right about that. And the autism rates keep on going up and government's mm. not worried. And it just really frustrates me that, you know, we yeah. know we're going to have a huge crisis once all these kids grow up. And, a new crop of kids all with autism, it's going to be really disastrous. So we really have to confront this problem. But um, deuterium, uh, so then uh, 2019, Laszlo basically we sent me email, uh, blind emails that congratulations. So he was very interested in a paper that I had written together with Dr. Greg Nye. And then he said, oh, by the way, do you know about deuterium? And I didn't, you know, and so, uh, but I immediately picked up on it because I became aware pretty quickly that the enzymes that manage deuterium are the same enzymes that get disrupted by glyphosate. There's a very mm. good lineup between those two. So that if glyphosate is poisoning those enzymes, deuterium is just like the metals. It's really like, almost like a metal. It won't be properly handled by the body and it will cause enormous problems. And I think it may be central. I, I, at this point, I think deuterium may be central to glyphosate's toxicity. Uh, you know, if mm. you want to say the number one most important problem with glyphosate is messing up the the biological system that has become very sophisticated to handle deuterium. So what is deuterium? It's heavy hydrogen. And we first learned how to concentrate deuterium during World War II. It was a part of the mm. whole process to develop the atom bomb. They, they wanted to have heavy water uh, as a critical piece of the puzzle in making the atom bomb. And so they figured out how to make this water that had really high deuterium. Deuterium is a natural element. It's kind of like carbon-14. You know, it's a mm. variant of hydrogen. And hydrogen is the smallest atom. It has one electron and one proton, very tiny thing. And, of course, hydrogen is by far the most common uh, atom in our body. 
huge amounts of hydrogen and it's and hydrogen is involved in every reaction you can think of. You almost can't have a reaction without hydrogen being involved. So very, very impart, important in biochemistry. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so uh, deuterium is heavy hydrogen. It has an extra neutron as well as a proton. It makes it twice as heavy as hydrogen and it behaves very differently from hydrogen biophysically yes. and biochemically. And that's what makes it special because it goes everywhere hydrogen goes. So wherever there could be a hydrogen attached to a carbon, there can also be a deuterium. Mm -hmm. And it's randomly present in nature at 155 parts per million in seawater, which sounds small, but it's not trivial because of the fact that Mm -hmm. hydrogen is so common. So in our Mm -hmm. circulation, it's five or six times as as common as, as calcium. And of course, we have calcium in the blood. We have five or six times as much deuterium as we do calcium. Wow. And the thing is, it matters because of the biochemistry, because of it behaving differently from hydrogen. It turns out that it, it has a devastating effect on the mitochondria if there's too much. And that's the critical, critical thing. As a consequence of that, all living forms have come up with strategies for assuring they have to deliver lots of protons to the mitochondria because that's how the energy works. You know, the mitochondria have this intermembrane space that gets piled full of protons by these Mm -hmm. enzymes that push them in. And then those protons come out through these ATPase pumps at these cilia that are inside the mitochondria. They come out, uh, they're trying to get back because there's a proton gradient. You know, there's not nearly as many protons on the other side that causes them to want to come out. And they, and they actually drive the pump. It's kind of like a water, a water, you know, using water for as a source of energy in a way, pumping the protons through. And that makes the ATPase pumps create the ATP, which is the energy source of life. And so very, very important to the mitochondria. Mitochondria is central to the cells. And mitochondrial dysfunction is a major problem in multiple diseases. You know, all these neurodegenerative diseases and autism and uh, cancer, all of those diseases have a basis Mm -hmm. in mitochondrial dysfunction. We know that. Many papers talk about that. The dysfunction, I think, is primarily due to excess deuterium. In the intermembrane mm-hmm. space, absolutely, and this is and this is again is runs parallel to what we were talking about with uh, Dr. Borosh as well. Um, and you touched on something there that I think I would love to just just dive a little bit deeper into that. You mentioned about um, obviously this this kind of key link between the enzymes that are being uh, sort of disrupted by glyphosate, and and this is then allowing deuterium to accumulate and it's all kind of centered around the, the, the microbiome to to an extent. What What is that enzyme pathway, if you don't mind, uh, Stephanie, just, just diving into that a little bit more? Um, okay, and, and sure. And actually, um, it gets back to the gut, gut microbes because the gut microbes actually play an essential role in supplying deuterium depleted nutrients to the host. Yes. This is very, very interesting. And, um, and they do so by a remarkable process. And I don't know if Dr. Bro has talked about this, uh, it was kind of my idea, and I think it's correct. Um, I discovered a paper from the 1960s um, that was looking at um, the hydrogen gas that's produced by microbes uh, mm. compared to the hydrogen that's uh, uh, connected to the various organic matters uh, molecules. So these these microbes have a special ability to make hydrogen gas by yes. pulling hydrogen off of organic molecules, put two hydrogen atoms together and make H2, which then becomes a gas. And that gas actually shows up in your gut. You know, it's produced by the mind. You can actually Mm -hmm. test how much hydrogen gas you have coming out of your breath. And that hydrogen gas is incredibly important. And and people don't realize this, I think. Um, They're not aware. Um, Because what happens to the hydrogen gas is that there are other microbes that uh, react it with carbon dioxide. And they can make two, at least two very important nutrients. Uh, Well, one is methane, which is not a Mm -hmm. nutrient until you do something more with it, but it starts with methane gas, right? And we know you get methane gas and the cows are producing lots of methane. They're they're saying that it's causing uh, climate problems, you know, because it's a really good greenhouse gas. It's like 50 times as strong as carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. So they're worried about the methane, but the methane needs to go back into organic matter. It's a process of making gas and making hydrogen gas grabbing some carbon dioxide, putting it together with a hydrogen gas and making methane. And then you have to do more with the methane to be able to capture it. And you convert Mm -hmm. it, they convert, the the microbes do this, they convert it to methanol and then formaldehyde and then formate. And they actually come all the way back around again to carbon dioxide. So there's a whole cycle in the gut that seems futile. It's making carbon dioxide back to carbon dioxide. 
But on, on the way, it's grabbing those hydrogens and sticking them back onto organic molecules. And mm-hmm. those hydrogens are going to be severely depleted in deuterium because of the gas. So you have to start with the hydrogen gas to get that. And the hydrogen gas is 80% depleted in deuterium compared to the hydrogen molecules that were left behind, you know, mm-hmm. it, uh, still, still stuck to the molecule. So it has a very... A uh, very strong ability to prefer hydrogen over deuterium when you make the gas. And part of that is just a natural difference between deuterium and hydrogen because deuterium likes to stick to things more because it's heavier. It doesn't want to go into the gas phase as easily as, as the hydrogen does. And then I suspect the enzyme also has the delicately designed, you know, strategy for making it even more so because I think this 80% reduction is quite remarkable. So that hydrogen mm-hmm. gas is pure gold as far as the body's concerned. And it makes the methane. And then there's other microbes that can make uh, acetate. And mm. acetate is basically methane with the carbon dioxide stuck to it. So that's yes. also, that's got methane captured in organic matter that's not a gas. So the acetate is incredibly important as a nutrient with low deuterium because it came wow. from that hydrogen gas, which is really, really interesting to me. So the good microbes make acetate, uh, which is a, sh- a short chain fatty acid. You know, and, and the short chain fatty acids that the gut microbes make, the acetate, butyrate, and propionate, are really important for the host because all of them are going to be low in deuterium. Butyrate is basically mm-hmm. two acetates stuck together. It is made that way. So all of this is derived from that hydrogen gas that had really low deuterium. And therefore, those nutrients that the microbes made from the gas are extremely mm-hmm. valuable to the host. That's fascinating. That, <clears throat> and there are so many examples of these uh these interactions with the with the microbiome you know across our body but particularly in the gut you know and one of them you just outlined there these kind of this kind of gaseous gaseous sort of transfer and recycling is just just absolutely invaluable and it's that symbiosis that that we're kind of striving for but you know you add glyphosate into the mix which ruins this uh this scenario you now have an an influx of, of deuterium into the body and then but we've got all the downstream effects that we that we've just covered off, obviously, which is which is massively deleterious to health, and as you said, could be linked to so many different different conditions. So, so for those people that are you know that are listening in and thinking, okay, then that's 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 all well and good, you know. So I need to draw back on the uh, on the glyphosate and uh, make sure that I'm that I'm getting it out of my diet. There, are, there is something else that you mentioned as well, uh, Stephanie, but that was quite that I found quite interesting. This role of sulfate and sulfation as well, um, and that potentially might have a, a mitigating effect on, on on glyphosate. If you don't mind exploring that a little bit more as well, because I think this was really really fascinating. Absolutely, yeah. And in fact, what I will say is there are these two massive pathways that are very important in biology: the sulfation pathways and the methylation pathways. Yes. And people hear quite a bit about methylation pathways and methylation mm-hmm. defects. It's associated with autism. The autis- autistic kids often have genetic mutations in certain genes, you know, for proteins that are essential for the methylation pathways. And and both of those pathways are critically involved with deuterium. That's what's so interesting. And glyphosate wrecks both of them. So mm-hmm. it's really a home run as far as glyphosate is concerned. <laughs> and I didn't mention, everything. you know, it, it is true that glyphosate uh, disrupts the microbes. Bifidobacteria are very sensitive to glyphosate. Bifidobacteria mm-hmm. are a major source of that hydrogen gas. So right there, you've got a problem. There isn't enough hydrogen gas. Yeah. And then, um, and then a study has shown that glyphosate reduces the levels of acetate in in the gut, and that's exactly what I'm saying. It can't make enough acetate, and um, and and also the glyphosate raises the pH of the gut, and and the acid loving bacteria are the ones that make these short chain fatty acids. So they get disrupted. Mm-hmm. Butyrate goes way down when the pH goes up. It's it's the acid base you know balance. The gut is not as sufficiently acidic to support those microbes and that's when you get the overgrowth of other microbes that are pathogens that cause its inflammatory gut and all of that so it makes very good sense to me i have a chapter on the book in the book where i talk about a lot of that uh, that, that whole issue with glyphosate in the gut um, and then the sulfation yeah. pathways as well so i just wanted to finish up the methylation because dehydrogenases yeah, dehydrogenases are a really big deal and, and they are critically involved they take hydrogen out of organic matter and they stick it onto a, a, a molecule called NAD plus mm-hmm. and they yes. make NADH. So there's all kinds of reactions include NAD plus goes to NADH. And that H is a golden H if it came from, if you can trace it back to hydrogen gas. And that's the case. These gut microbes are constantly wanting to make NADH 
out of an age that they know is going to be good because it came from hydrogen gas. There's like a whole strategy there of making NADH. And that H, NADH dehydrogenase is the enzyme that delivers that H to the mitochondrial intramembrane space. That's a critical mm-hmm. thing to the ATPase pumps. So NADH dehydrogenase it has been shown to be suppressed by glyphosate in E. coli bacteria, as well as a dozen other dehydrogenases. So glyphosate messes up dehydrogenases. And it does so, I think, by substituting for glycine. And I talked about that in my book, that there's a certain sequence that's critical in dehydrogenases that involves glycine. And mm-hmm. glyphosate mm-hmm. substitutes for that glycine and erects that enzyme. So I think that's the process by which it happens. And those dehydrogenases get messed up, and then you cannot deliver adequate amounts of healthy hydrogens to the mitochondria. Mm-hmm. And then the sulfation mm-hmm. pathway is similar. There's all these critical enzymes that are involved in the sulfation pathway. Um, that depend upon, and I have this thing called the glyphosate susceptibility motif that I talk about in my book, and it's a characteristic feature of certain enzymes, and it's specifically enzymes that bind phosphate. They bind a a molecule that contains phosphate. They bind the phosphate at a site where where glycine is highly conserved. This is well known. And so one of those enzymes is an enzyme that makes PAPS, which is phosphodenosyl phosphosulfate, Perhaps mm-hmm. that's the universal sulfate donor. And the enzyme that makes that from sulfate and from ATP uh, is disrupted by glyphosate. And, and so what happens is, and that's been shown again in E. coli. And mm-hmm. so, um, and also the enzyme that makes methionine is disrupted by glyphosate. And methionine is the universal methyl donor. So you've got both the sulfation and methation, methylation pathways being disrupted yeah. by glyphosate. Sulfation pathways. I mean, that's a, a whole yeah. bunch of things that are critical is sulfate. Yeah. But one of them that I talked about in my book is heparin sulfate, which is all yeah. over the body in the what's called the extracellular matrix, the stuff that hangs out around the cells. And, for example, lining all the all the blood vessels, what they call the glycocalyx. Yes. The glycocalyx contains these complicated sugar complexes that have sulfate stuck all over the place in them. There's lots of sulfate, heparin sulfate. And that particular molecule, heparin sulfate, is so important in the in the circulation along the blood vessels. I mean, mm-hmm. actually everywhere, but in the blood vessels, it creates uh, gelled water. So the sulfate, the sulfated yes. uh, glycosaminoglycans, they're called in difficult words. I call them gags, G-A-G-S, yeah. sulfated gags. <laughs> easier. And those guys need all that sulfate. And they can have more sulfate or less sulfate depend, depending upon how much can be supplied. But I think we're systemically deficient in sulfate in yes. those gly- yeah, gags lining the blood vessels, which means then that we're deficient in gelled water as well. The gelled water is insufficient. Most of the water in our body should be gelled. And, mm-hmm. and, and it's made, maintained as a gel because of those sulfates. And the gel actually traps deuterium. This is what's so fascinating to me. The gel traps yeah. deuterium. And, um, and then it pushes out protons. And this is Jerry Pollock's work, and I've read both of yes. his books. He's a fascinating person with really interesting stuff that he's learned, and I've enjoyed reading all of that and trying to understand the biophysics of the situation. But the mm. the gel is formed, it's gelled water that's formed by the sulfate, and the gel traps the deuterium, and it pushes out protons that are going to be deuterium-depleted for that reason. So it's pushing deuterium-depleted protons out into the blood, which is meaning then that the blood that's circulating is low in deuterium because it's trapped in the gel. But when you don't have enough sulfate, you don't have enough gel, you have insufficient ability to trap deuterium in the gel. So now you've got higher deuterium in the circulation, which is then going to feed into higher deuterium into the mitochondria. So the whole system, the sulfation pathway and the methylation pathway, methylation pathway comes from methane, right? Methane gas. And it gets converted into methane thiol. And then that gets converted into methionine. And mm-hmm. in the gut, and so methionine in the gut is a universal methyl donor, and that and that and eventually those methyls get populated all over the histones, you know, that regulate the DNA expression. Absolutely. If you have low uh, methylation in the DNA, you've got cancer, risk of cancer, and so um, and of course methylation pathways are disrupted in autism. All these different conditions that are associated with impaired methylation pathways. Yes. Direct hit from glyphosate. It's, it's just so fascinating stuff. Thank you so much. That was a, a whistle stop tour of <laughs> right up and down, as you say, right down to the nucleus of the DNA up to, as you said, the glycocalyx. And and on that note, actually, 
uh, before I say something else on what you just said, but uh, we actually had uh, Dr. Michael Twyman, who's a cardiologist who came on some time ago, and he was talking all about the importance of the glycocalyx, particularly for men, um, because again, obviously, if you don't have good blood flow, uh, then, you know, think one of the first signs that, you know, there's a disruption to the glycocalyx and that there's, there's problems with nitric oxide production is e erections for men. They don't work. There's work problems. Yeah, and this is something that we, we hear, we hear about this all the time. And he was saying about the importance of the EZ water or this gel water for maintaining, you know, the flow of uh, red blood cells, you know, throughout the, the circulatory system. But it's so interesting what you said there about uh, the, the methylation pathways, because one of the things that, that has cropped up in, in the past when, I mean, I don't do an awful lot of functional testing nowadays, but in the past, when I first sort of got into this area, it was something that was very popular, certainly. And obviously people can be um, core methylators in a sense, um, already just from, from genetic differences um, mm -hmm. in, their, in, in their profile, in their genotype. So what you're suggesting is that if you're already a poor methylator and then you add glyphosate exactly. on top, you're now redoubling the problem and you're compounding it in, a, in such a large way. And then if, I, if my mind goes a little bit further, that totally then makes sense why potentially, as you said, there's a link here between glyphosate, deuterium, and then autism, because again, poor methylation is something that we see again in, in many children presenting with autism as well. So this is so fascinating. Um, one, one thing about the sulfation though, that I thought was also curious as well, because we often obviously mention to our uh, gentlemen about trying to get adequate amounts of infrared light, obviously from natural sunlight as well. I know that mm -hmm. you talk about this in your book as one of your key uh, points to, to consider. We're trying to get, get rid of the glyphosate or at least go le low glyphosate. Um, and obviously that has a role in, in sulfation um, in the body. But again, if you've, if you've got tons of glyphosate and through your diet and it's building up, that's not going to work well either. So it's, it's right. just uh, all of it. All these things that people are trying to do are just not going to work as well when you don't deal with this core problem of, um, of glyphosate being in your in your diet. So this isn't just a passing problem. This is this is massive. It's so systemic. And then the other thing is collagen, and collagen is really interesting. Yeah, I talked about please. collagen in my book. Uh, collagen is the most common protein in the body. A mm. third of our proteins are collagen, and it's the glue, you know, and it hangs out in the, all. It's the it's the structure to which those glycosaminoglycans are attached. Yes. And then it's all populated together with this big complicated stuff that's making that gel. And yeah. the collagen has um, lots and lots of glycine. It has long, long sequences of GXY, 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 where every third amino acid is a glycine. And they know that various mutations in those glycines, even a single glycine in that collagen can be something different in a particular person's genome as a mutation. Mm -hmm. And they can have uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is mm -hmm. a syndrome where you have these very flexible you know, joints. Yes. I don't have it. I'm really I'm not <laughs> flexible at all. You, <laughs> think you can like put your, you know, put your thumb against yeah. your arm. Very flexible joints, and those people often have a lot of issues with their joint joints yes, and their do. bones they do. Um, because of this one mutation in one glycine. So collagen has all these glycines, and glyphosate can substitute for any of them. So I think as you get more and more collagen, more and more glycine, glyphosate, you've got it populating your collagen all over your body. Collagen often sticks around for a long time, so you get it trapped in mm. your collagen. It messes up its ability to form its triple helix structure, which is really beautiful. This triple helix structure depends on those glycines. So when yeah. that gets messed up, the collagen doesn't behave properly as far as its tensile strength and its ability to, to trap water. All these things that it can do are no longer working well. And you get joint pain, you get bone problems, you know, ache, aches and pains all over the place. You get back pain and knee, knee surgery and, and hip replacement surgery, all these things that are happening. All of these things are becoming more and more common. Mm. these days and and people it's so funny to me that people don't wonder why <laughs> we're so <laughs> sickly that compared to how we used to be it's funny how Absolutely. people just adjust to the new normal you know totally and, and and i've brought this up a few times with other with other guests on the on the channel but i mean particularly with uh, uh our recent guest uh, dr jack cruz and um, we were talking about the uh the sort of decentralization of the fitness industry that you know that, that needs to happen really i mean he's he's quite he's pushing for decentralization in medicine and and thinking outside the box like considering things like glyphosate and the diet and then obviously our, our natural environment but we did raise this point that there is this it does seem to be this lack of robustness 
in, yes. in 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 individuals these days you know and, and it seems to be getting worse you know as you said yes. with this i think it's like the stats i think it's like one in ten children present now with uh, with some sort of food allergy and, and even that when it's, I was the numbers growing, are incredible over half the, the kids oh, have some kind of chronic disease absolutely you know, it's, asthma it's, and it's, eczema and obesity i mean you see childhood obesity is an epidemic you know it's just in america it's just it's just ridiculous we see so many people that are you know, huge. I, it's now common to see someone that's so huge that when I was a child, I would have gawked. I mean, I would have been so shocked to see someone that big. But now it's like every day, you know, <laughs> so many Absolutely. people that just weigh huge amounts. And that's and I think that's glyphosate disrupting the endocrine system. And I did Definitely. talk some about that in my book as well. Obesity and diabetes. Diabetes is going up dramatically, exactly in step with glyphosate. All these diseases, these modern diseases that we deal with, high blood pressure, High blood cholesterol. Uh, glyphosate is connected to all of them. Absolutely, uh, it, it def- and you make a very, very strong case for it. And it's a, I definitely came away convinced that that it's, it's, it's definitely that the links are everywhere, like a like a tenuous spider's web, linking to all <laughs> yeah. these different con- conditions. Um, mm-hmm. But um, let's, I mean, let's talk about then uh, what what one can do in, in a sense to to actually get get glyphosate down so obviously there's going to be different different levels to this so perhaps we could take each one in turn so obviously there's reducing the amount that's coming in dealing with maybe dealing with what you have at present i guess and then also the aspect is then perhaps strengthening your ability your body's ability to to actually remove it in the first place because obviously if it's being used in the environment sprayed onto crops i mean it's you're going to be breathing it in if you walk through a park, you know, potentially, yes. the, you know, it's, 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 you cannot, you cannot avoid it in, in many ways. You know, it's everybody probably is, has got some level of glyphosate in their body, um, unless they're living on a tropical Island, uh, somewhere. And it's, but even then it's probably, uh, it's probably still got, got to them somehow. Um, so maybe, yeah, but wherever you want to go first, uh, Stephanie, like where well, I you... think the most important thing is to eat a certified organic diet. And fortunately in the United States, yeah, certified organic is, is strong and growing. Most of even the common grocery stores offer cert- certified organic products in many cases. And, um, and I think people really need to be aware that that's the most important thing they yes. can do is to buy certified organic. And you need to know which foods are more, most highly contaminated. Mm-hmm. And certainly the grains, um, people don't realize that they think non-GMO, oh, good, non-GMO, I'm safe. And that's not true at all. Some of the highest levels are found in non-GMO foods. For example, Cheerios, which is oats, you know, and wheat-based foods because oats and wheat are both sprayed commonly right before harvest as a desiccant. And and this has caused, this is actually higher levels are found in many cases in the wheat-based foods than in something like GMO corn, you know, or soy. Mm -hmm. So they have corn, soy, canola, and sugar beets are all GMO crops in the United States. Exactly. And in much of Europe, they don't allow these GMO crops, but they do allow glyphosate. So a lot of people think, oh, glyphosate's not a problem in Europe, but that's not true because oh, they do allow these. Yeah. So they <laughs> allow the use of glyphosate, but not the GMO. So we have a much worse problem here. Canada did a big study where they measured uh, the levels of glyphosate in all kinds of foods, uh, imports from Europe, imports from the U.S., Canadian foods, imports from Mexico. And, um, and they found uh, the highest levels consistently were in foods from Canada and the United States and Europe came in and Mexico came in pretty much in line with Europe which generally much lower levels which is really good yeah. news I don't know about the UK I think the UK might be worse than mainland Europe but I'm not sure it, it, it is unfortunately because obviously of our um, recent exit from uh, the rest of our comrade, <laughs> comrades in, uh, in the rest of Europe but um, yeah um, the recent sort of EU uh, stance on on glyphosate really is just to push the issue back in many ways there was there was going to be some they had a big uh, battle i was hoping it might be the yeah. case that they wouldn't renew it but then of course they did i mean the yeah. industry has so much power it's very frustrating to me that we don't mind having our population be so sick you know it's fine absolutely. that just absolutely. really frustrates me <laughs> it is it's, it's, it's absolutely crazy uh but it's interesting that you mentioned there about obviously the role of uh glyphosate being used so extensively in in wheat growing as a desiccant uh, to to dry the crops out effectively and i guess then that naturally makes one lead their mind to think well perhaps this is part of the reason why processed foods and as you said you know you gave the mention of like mcdonald's and fast foods which obviously extensively use wheat flour um it's not just the gmos as you say it's also 
the massive amounts of glyphosate in these foods. And again, it could have been from all over the world. So we don't even have to go into that story around deuterium and obviously the levels changing across you know different latitudes around the world. But just the fact that there's so much glyphosate in, in these products, it's not being tested mm-hmm. for you're already Mm -hmm. compounding it. So an organic diet is, is definitely the way to go um, Mm -hmm. to rid yourself. Then I guess. um, Yeah. Then I would also say uh, sunlight exposure and so, and high sulfur foods. So Mm -hmm. making sure you have plenty of sulfur and making sure you can use it properly. Uh, Sunlight exposure. Of course, we mentioned about the UV, um, the infrared light, it grows the exclusion zone by a factor of four. That's the exclusion zone is the gelled water that creates the protons that are pumped out. Those protons are low in deuterium, so it's really important to get sunlight exposure, natural light. And I think, uh, and I also think that the um, not the vitamin D. You know, people talk about vitamin D is so important. They say take the vitamin D supplements. I say no. I say get out in the sunlight for the vitamin D, but also because the sunlight. I believe the sunlight is stimulating the production of cholesterol sulfate in the mm. skin. And the cholesterol sulfate is released into the circulation, and that is carrying the sulfate. So cholesterol sulfate is delivering both cholesterol and sulfate to the tissues. And both mm. of them are really, really important for your health. So with the cholesterol sulfate can go into the, it's really a cool molecule because the cholesterol goes into the membranes of whatever particles are in the blood. For example, the HDL particles, typically the HDL particles, which are the good, the good guys, you know, you have the LDL and the HDL. Yeah. Um, and well, people so say termed, yeah. HDL is good <laughs> and it's too low and that's a critical thing. You need to make it higher. The HDL particles are the ones that can carry um, cholesterol sulfate in their membrane. They pick it up from the skin and then they can pass it around and they can deliver it to all the tissues, including the heart, which actually desperately wants both the cholesterol and the sulfate. And people think uh, high cholesterol is a problem. The reason why you have high LDL is because, I believe, because you don't have enough cholesterol sulfate. Because Mm -hmm. that that one is, is water soluble. It can actually hop from the skin into the HDL particle without having to be packaged up inside some lipid particle. The uh, mm-hmm. liver has to release more LDL uh, when the cholesterol is deficient and the sulfate is deficient. It has to release more LDL to distribute all these things inside it that otherwise could have been carried if they had been sulfated. So because of the sulfation deficiency problem, more of the cholesterol and the fats have to be packaged up inside these LDL particles Mm-hmm. that the liver releases in order to deliver those goods to the tissues mm-hmm. uh, because of the lack of sulfate that they can't just be thrown into the water, thrown into the blood as a as a molecule of cholesterol sulfate, which will then find its way into some membrane somewhere and actually help to build gelled water around that uh, particle. So LDL particle actually picks up the cholesterol sulfate that's circulating in the blood, puts the cholesterol into the membrane, the sulfate is sticking out and making gelled water around yes. that particle, which is protecting the LDL from damage. So you so need the sulfate to keep the LDL particle safe from oxidation damage, from glycation damage. And it's the oxidized and glycated LDL that's the problem in heart disease. Exactly. So the problem goes back to sulfate deficiency, not cholesterol excess. And people Absolutely. don't realize that. So they're taking a statin drug to try to dist- you know, prevent their liver from making mm-hmm. cholesterol, which is a huge mistake because cholesterol is an essential. It's essential for animal life. Mm-hmm. And, and for the brain, especially, there's lots and lots of cholesterol in the brain. You don't want it to be deficient. <laughs> you know, so. No, absolutely not. I mean, it, it's a it's 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 a vital part of every cell in the body. You know, and it's and it's uh, we often you know liken it to the the bricks of a of a house that you're building. It's so important, and as you say, there's it just doesn't make logical sense that uh, you it would that would be automatically killing us, you know, causing heart attacks at all. There's, the story is so much deeper than that. And one thing that, that, that made me think there is um, often uh, in the context of kind of coronary heart disease, which obviously is, is, is the number one killer uh, around the world, um, and, and particularly of men as well, and it's something that we, we routinely screen for with our, with our chaps as well, is um, you mentioned there about the, obviously the lipoproteins, you, having to shunt cholesterol from one to another depending on the sulfation status the i wonder as well if the uh, glyphosate can actually get into the structure of of the ldls themselves um because obviously they they are a protein structure and then they they themselves are not as um efficient at carrying right you could easily have later. glyphosate substituting for glycine in the ldl yes uh, in the in the apo apo protein of the ldl 
and exactly. messing that up. That's quite possible. Yeah, I think that is yeah. something worth considering. Absolutely. Yeah, it's fun to go shopping and try to find which proteins are likely to be most susceptible. That's a game that I I play. <laughs> and uh, exactly, it's only the collagen, it you know. Totally, totally, and it, yeah, it, it is fun to sort of do these. I guess these kind of mind uh, kind of maps and games, you know, to think, you know, where could it be going? But it's but it's 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 crucial. I think the the point being is that um, quite often when we're we're trying to improve health and we're trying to tackle these various problems like heart disease, you know, the the, the latest thing obviously is to you know cut the seed oils, you know, cut the carbohydrates, you know, straight away, you know, the sugars, obviously straight away. But, um, but that is only part of the story here. And I think it's only, again, it's the surface level where we need to go a little bit deeper and think actually there's, there's something at the core of this that's, that's keeping the fire burning as it were. And that's going to continue with this oxidation process and, you know, not going to necessarily get the, the uh, improvement in health that we, that we want. And, uh, this is just a fascinating area. You mentioned there also, um, uh, Stephanie, that obviously that, that sunlight can help in the body. It made me think there as well about some of these other sort of contrast therapies that um, obviously have been around for millennia, but have made a bit of a comeback, things like saunas. Um, or yes, I think so, exposure. actually. I like that idea mm. because I think it's quite possible that you're pushing glyphosate out. We know glyphosate shows up in the urine. So it probably shows mm. up in the sweat as well. So when you sweat it out, you know, you're getting rid of the glyphosate through the sweat. I think that's quite possible exactly. as a way so, to get rid of the glyphosate. So again, exercise would, would also help to do that as well. Obviously, where you sweat, uh, you know, lifting something yes, up and uh -huh. putting it down again, where you don't sweat is not going to make much of a difference necessarily. But, but yeah, but the, you know, kind of classic cardiovascular exercise where you sweat might all do that. And then sauna as well would do as well but cold and then um, and then eating a high sulfur diet i mentioned that one eating a high sulfur diet and that's uh and that's pretty easy i like those foods anyway the cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and cauliflower and, and brussels sprouts and, like and then garlic and onions yeah so those are all great sources of sulfur on the vegetable side and of course there's lots of sulfur really good sulfur because it's um, amino acids containing sulfur are really important, especially taurine, for example, is in animal-based foods. Mm. There's almost there's no taurine in any vegetable except for seaweed. It's the only mm. vegetable that has taurine, which is quite amazing. But a taurine is a sulfur-containing amino acid, and it's it's present in high amounts in animal-based foods. And so mm. that's meats, you know, and and seafood and um, and fish. All those uh, fish have high high taurine. So um, so I would encourage people to eat. Uh, Animal-based foods for the uh, for the sulfur-containing amino acids, which is cysteine and, and taurine and, and methionine and uh, homocysteine. Yeah, those are all uh, very important uh, amino it acids. Uh, sulfur-containing amino acids. Absolutely, it also kind of uh, strengthens this. Uh, I guess the uh, the uh, the kind of theory around um, human ancestry that um, we we kind of um, got to where we are today by eating predominantly a high DHA and seafood based diet. And as you mentioned, exactly, I think the seafood sulfine. was crucial for our development. I, I have a theory. I, I endorse the theory of uh, humans evolving on the seashore. You know, um, Elaine Morgan, I read a book by Elaine Morgan many, many years ago. It was really fascinating about an idea that we became human on the seashore. And I think that's probably correct. So yeah. we're eating lots and lots of seafood, shellfish, you know, uh, lobsters and clams and, and uh, oysters and all of that. Super healthy foods. Um, unfortunately, hard to get these days, especially if you live in the middle of the country, you know, <laughs> U.S. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. But in the distant past, I guess that's it. If that's if that's the way the theory goes, then that was that's what we were what we were doing. It was um, Professor Michael Crawford um, who um, uh, we recently uh, talked to about this um, because of his work that he's been doing on the. Uh, on the brain and human development in the 70s he he sort of coined this uh this thought around um uh that human beings might well have uh, evolved is similar to to the research you mentioned as well um on this kind of seafood diet and uh, just again linking that together with the sulfation just brings more strength to this 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 recommendation as well and why mm -hmm. we recommend so strongly to our our gents you know you must eat seafood it's just so important if you can get it and it's it's clean and yes. uh, Good quality food. So, um, one thing that. And then um, I wanted I, to add that deuterium, low deuterium nutrients, so you can actually eat foods that are low in deuterium, and that's going to yes. be fats. Mostly that's fats. And, uh, yes. and so, um, animal based fats is really, really healthy for that reason, I think, because of the low, low deuterium in the fats. Absolutely, absolutely, and and also low in uh, deuterium, uh, potentially, yes, as, as well. Low in deuterium, depending. that's the fats, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, so again, higher fats, not fearing fats is, is actually, is actually hugely beneficial in, in this scenario as well. And um, one more thing I wanted to, to get your thoughts on, uh, Stephanie as well is again, another popular mod- modality for either longevity or, uh, for eating or time restricted feeding is, um, is, is fasting. And obviously that's mm-hmm. been, again, been practiced for millennia. Um, amongst religious groups or just because the humans had a scarcity of food in, in, in the distant past mm-hmm. but obviously it's made a bit of a comeback in the same vein as obviously uh potentially the uh the sauna and the uh, and the cold exposure in terms of reducing the load on glyphosate my my thought is that glyphosate obviously is being stored in as a substitute for for glycine but is it concentrated in places like adipose tissue and a lot in, in higher concentrations at all? And in, in which case, if you fasted, there's, a, there's an efflux of free fatty acids into the bloodstream and potentially maybe some, glyce- uh, some glyphosate comes out as well. Yeah, I don't know. It's not a fat soluble uh, toxin, but there are okay. other toxins that are going to accumulate in the fats. Um, and, and glyphosate is going to encourage them to accumulate in the fats because glyphosate messes up the enzymes that detoxify fat soluble mm. toxins so we have a lot of a lot of the insecticides and fungicides you know various uh, the, the forever chemicals these things yeah um, need the liver to, to to modify the the molecule in order to make it water soluble and Definitely. part of that is actually sulfation so that in this in this uh using glutathione glut, glutathionylation mm. sulfation methylation all these things uh are done to make these molecules water soluble so that mm. they can be released through the kidneys and so those enzymes all become defective in the liver because of glyphosate mm. and that means that these fat soluble chemicals have to be stored in fat and i've often wondered whether that's what's causing abdominal obesity because we see a lot of issues with abdominal obesity where these fat soluble toxins can't be disposed of and so they get stuffed into the fat cells sitting there and then when you diet they are released it's not it's not necessarily mm. the glyphosate but it's those other things but the glyphosate is also going to be released but not necessarily from the fat it's because the um you are going to uh, break down this sort of autophagy right autophagy breaks mm. down um your own molecules that are sort of no longer useful or whatever and they can be damaged by you know things like sunlight or or exposure to toxins you have these damaged molecules that are no longer functional and you need to clear them and a lot mm. of people, including autistic kids, have issues with autophagy not working correctly, mm. not working adequately. And so these toxic molecules accumulate. Lots of times it's to- toxic fats, actually. They get modified by oxidation damage. And they, and, they, and they all need to be cleared. But if you're clearing the toxic proteins, because they can get glycated, you know, protein glycation, they need to be uh, cleared. Um, Gosh. It, by starving yourself, your body has to get its nutrition from its own sources from things that are lying around in the cells so they end up Mm. uh, kicking in the autophagy pathway and breaking down proteins for example that are no longer needed or they're they're defective in some way they can do that better because of the uh, being hungry you know and when they do that they release glyphosate because the glyphosate will be freed up from any protein any protein that's say not working properly pops possibly because it's got a glycine a glyphosate at a critical spot it needs to be broken down and reassembled into something else. And when you break it down, you free up that glyphosate molecule. And now it can go and go someplace else. And so that can also be a problem that you'll release free glyphosate during starvation, which will contribute to the other toxins that are being released from the fat. So you've got a lot of things wow. potentially that could cause um, a, a reaction to these toxins yeah. that are being released as a consequence of, of dieting. But the whole point of the diet is to help to get rid of them and to make autophagy work in order to clear, you know, these damaged cells because uh, mm. these damaged nutrients, because that's that needs to be done, and and uh, and fasting can help you to do that. So I think that's okay. it's a feature, but there's a question mark as to whether it could also cause trouble. <laughs> so quite and and and, along, and I think along the... the way, you know, that's a lot of the problem with these things is that in order to get them out, you have to suffer, you know, through yeah, a phase. And... Yeah, and and I think it it then it just lends more strength to the position. If you're going to do something like an extended fast, you know, for several days, you really should be doing it under medical supervision. You know, because, mm-hmm. especially if you have got a high level of body fat, and there, you know, you, maybe you think you might have been exposed to 
high levels of toxins in the past. I mean, I I, I can't recall the, the the author, but a number of years ago, I read um, a paper that, that kind of outlined some of the things that you mentioned there about toxins being released, and they were talking in in the uh, in the paper about the release of things like DDT from uh, mm-hmm, people's exactly. fat tissue yes. and appearing in the urine, uh, and, and an enormous number of different chemicals. And this these were these individuals were farmers, so that made sense because DDT is uh, <laughs> was used as a, as an insecticide. Um, but the um, but this just shows that this is not a uh, necessarily an easy process, and and also mm-hmm. it could it could potentially be um, be dangerous if um, mm-hmm. somebody has severe side effects from it. So proceed proceed gently and with caution. Be kind to your body. I think is the is the way to do it rather than heavy handed as some of our chaps like to do. Um, which right, you want way. you want to get done in a hurry, and you can really get too intense and end up with in trouble because your body can't handle. You have to do things slowly. Absolutely, absolutely. But I'm definitely going to explore this this idea of uh, the, the kind of a toxin overload potentially being a contributor to visceral fat because that's something that we do test for with our traps. We do DEXA scans and and yeah, we tend to look at how much their visceral fat they've got. But it'd be very interesting to correlate that with um, you know maybe to look at some uh, toxin. Uh, profiles as well and see if the the uh, the biggest bellies do have the uh, most amount of toxins <laughs> Good which point. would be interesting yes. <laughs> Good point. well well thank you so much stephanie as we kind of draw uh kind of this to a to a bit of a close um i just thought maybe you might have like kind of maybe a passing remark or some some words of wisdom for for anybody who's listening in and you know they've taken a lot of them in this uh podcast um what would you what would you recommend them to do or to think about as they as they kind of leave from today yeah, well, I can just remind them, eat a certified organic diet, eat a high sulfur diet, get out in the sunlight without sunscreen and also without sunglasses. I'm a big fan of the sun. Um, yeah. I don't wear I, I don't wear glasses. I don't wear sunglasses. My eyes are, are fine. I'm 70, 75 years old. Uh, no trouble with my eyes. Yeah. And my eyes actually got better when I stopped wearing my glasses. I, I'm not perfect vision, but but I can get by without my glasses. And uh, and, and I think it's uh, it's. Uh, important to get enough sunlight exposure to the eyes which actually helps if you don't have glyphosate because the glyphosate uh, get, gets in the way of the process that the mm. eyes can use uh, because of the melanin I didn't talk about this but melanin is a very protective agent natural agent from the sun melanin is what makes your skin get tanned and uh, there's lots of melanin in, melanin in critical places in the brain that are picking up the sunlight through the eyes um, you know, for example, with Parkinson's disease, there's a there's yes. a lot of melanin that protects that that substantia nigra, which is the black. It's black because of the melanin, and it can, and the melanin is protective against the um, the, the UV rays. But the sunlight is actually crucial for triggering the production of sulfate, which is critical in the mm. brain. So there's, you know, people think, oh, I got to avoid the sun. Uh, not true. I think that, uh, but mm. but on the other hand, if you have chemicals that are messing things up. The, the system won't work correctly. So the real big message is stay away from the toxic exposures as much as possible. All toxins, not just glyphosate. And then eat a healthy diet. Eat a whole foods diet. Don't eat processed foods. No. And, um, and, you know, go to the kitchen and cook. I mean, I think we need yeah. to get back to the kitchen. That's another thing that we're, we're we're so into convenience foods these days. We think we have more important things to do than cooking. But I think we need to get back to the idea that cooking is a good thing, good way to spend your time. And uh, and then the sunlight and then uh, the sulfur, uh, yeah. And then also eating a lot of herbs and spices. I haven't mentioned that yet. I really yeah. generously use herbs and spices in your cooking. They're very very healthy for the mitochondria. So that's kind of my formula for good health. Amazing words of words of wisdom. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie. It's been an amazing discussion. Thank you.